Okay, everyone, uh, I think we'll get started now. Uh, thank you all for joining our webinar entitled uh, Prioritizing the People's Budget. Uh, our event today is uh, aimed at centering the impact of our financial decisions on the people. Uh, and we will be hearing from three groups uh, that have done civic engagement around the city in order to figure out what the people need uh, for our city's budget this coming year. And I would like to welcome you all to uh, our co-branded uh, event with the Metropolitan Planning Council and the Chicago United for Equity Fellows. Uh, we would like to set a few virtual housekeeping reminders for you all. Uh, please use the Q&A function to submit questions and not to chat. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, so no worries if uh, there's something that you missed that you wanna refresh, uh, you will have access to that recording later and the presentation slides and recording will be emailed uh, to all the registrants after the event. Uh, and, and so no worries there. So uh, we're here today to talk about uh, the budget process and at its core, a city budget is a discussion about the needs of the people. It is a list of priorities that the city chooses to engage and move forward. And it is a plan for the city's future. A city's budget is a roadmap to invest in the infrastructure and services that residents value in their community. We, unfortunately, as everyone is well aware of, the impact of COVID-19 uh, has increased the need for services and there are pleas of an, an increasing racial equity uh, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. And uh, this, this time has really allowed uh, and given time to think and reevaluate on what priorities residents have and what they would like to see the city pursue in the future. Uh, it presents not only a challenge to our finances as uh, shelter in place orders, closing of businesses and revenue has uh, impacted our city services, but it is an opportunity to reimagine the future of our great city of Chicago. Our speakers today have all actively involved themselves in city discussions to guide our city's future and the values that shape our Chicago. Uh, our first speaker is Ivan Arinas. He's the Associate Director of the Institute of Research and for Research on Race and Public Policy at UIC. He is also uh, just an incredible person in, in terms of translating data into impacts on people and he has one of the best Zoom backgrounds in, in the world. So you'll see that shortly. I'm really excited for you all to see that. Our second speaker is Paula Aguirre. She's the founder of Borderless Studio. Uh, she is a brilliant designer and, and likes all of her installations and activities to be engaging to participants. She's also a, a senior fellow for Chicago United for Equity and likes to build community through all the work that she does. Our third speaker is Alderwoman Maria Haddon of the 49th Ward. Uh, she uh, not only is a, a great representative, but she, uh, she comes from an advocate background and she is used to engaging people and is an expert in lifting up voices to inform policymaking. And we're really happy to have her on this panel. Our, our next speaker is Candace Moore, the Chief Equity Officer for the, for the, uh, from the Office of the Mayor of the City of Chicago. Uh, Candace is a tireless racial justice advocate and racial equity expert. Uh, even though she probably works 12 plus hours a day in pursuit of socially just outcomes, she's always here with a smile on her face and we are so happy that she's been able to join us. Uh, J.D. Van Slyke is the first deputy of community engagement in the office of the mayor for the city of Chicago. He is tirelessly inclusive and tries to ensure that everybody uh, has a voice at the table and seeks feedback from all corners of Chicago. Uh, and he is, uh, he is a tireless 24 seven worker and hopefully he has some time for uh, himself, uh, but he is 100% engaged with community and is a great representative for the city. And I am Adam Slade, the effective government consultant for NPC. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Candace and JD to go through the city of Chicago's budget process and to give you some highlights of their budget engagement for the 2021 uh, year. Candace and JD. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Candace Moore. I'm the chief uh, chief equity officer in the mayor's office, and it's good to be with folks this morning. Um, I, I I can only be on for a, a short period of time because there's a lot of stuff going on today. But I did want to make sure that I joined JD and shared, at least from my perspective, a, uh, a little bit of, of the work that we've been able to do, and I think the opportunities that lay in front of us. So thank you all for making available this opportunity. Um, so just as a background, I'll, I'll share that the mission of the Office of Equity and Racial Justice is really to uh, seek equity in, um, in how the city does its business. Um, I say seek because I, we recognize that we're on a journey as a city um, in really building the muscle that's required to achieve equity. And that equity is both a process and a product. Um, I've gotten, a, uh, before I was at the city, I uh, was sort of a co-builder with Q. And, and one of the things that I still hold value um, as I do this work is that when we think about equity, we have to be thinking about it as a process and as a product. And that's something that we, we really sort of um, take to heart uh, as we try to build out this work out of the Office of Equity and Racial Justice. Um, and so what I'll say is uh, uh, sort of with that frame, um, at least for my office, and, and I know we, I've been in part partnership with the Office of Community Engagement really throughout this, is that we've been really thinking about this journey of budget equity um, really since the, since the uh, last year, since the first budget that this administration has done. Um, last year, I think some of the, uh, the ways in which we thought about it and the ways in which um, we really were able to Build some things that hadn't been done in the city for a while was uh, around thinking about how do we engage our communities better. The budget is an important document for the city. Uh, it guides so many programs and ultimately dollars. And it is true that just not a lot of people know what's going on in it. Um, not a lot of people feel like it's a document in which they can truly engage with and what they learn from it and what they hear from it are just sort of the sound clips that you might catch in the media. So what is our responsibility as a government to try to break down those silos, to try to break down those walls? And last year, I think a lot of our efforts focused around actually doing physical town halls and bringing those back. Uh, the mayor was really committed to those. She wanted to make sure that she was out in the neighborhoods talking with people about it. And so they took form as more of the traditional town hall that I think uh, people are kind of used to in government, um, where uh, the, the folks were able to present on it and then people were able to give comments back through um, both uh, orally uh, in the town halls, but then also written comments. There was also a budget survey that um, uh, last year allowed people to sort of talk about where they, they thought dollars should go and, and, and how that should be prioritized. And these things um, and these efforts were sort of our attempts to try to reach at some core values to the administration, which were around equity, transparency, and community engagement. Um, and I think we learned a lot from that process. Um, and I'm sure uh, when JD talks, we can kind of share a little bit about that. We learned a lot, but we also learned that there's, there's plenty more opportunity that we should be thinking about. And so as we turn to this year, um, we, we sit with the reality that COVID has constrained us in lots of different ways as we think about what it means to continue to grow in those values as a city. Um, it's constrained us, one, in the fact that when we think about engagement, the way we did it last year, the sort of personal engagement, uh, we're deep, we were deeply constrained. You know, there are lots of limitations around how we can gather in this moment. Um, uh, to the financial constraints that COVID um, has, has really uh, brought uh, to bear, um, whether those are the financial constraints of the revenue that's generated or just the increased cost or the different kinds of costs that we've seen. Um, we knew that we were going into this budget with a lot of pain that people have felt about uh, the way uh, uh, life was working and certainly the way government was showing up and will would show up in order to support some of the, 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 the dramatic changes that we're seeing in our communities right now. Um, 
but we still nonetheless needed to be able to have a conversation about it, still needed to lift up those values of, of, of seeking equity, seeking transparency and seeking deeper engagement. And so um, I am always so grateful to have uh, JD, who's going to share here in just a minute about what we've done, uh, sort of in partnership, really thinking about how do we adapt in, uh, in sort of this COVID world. We know we're not going to do as many in-person events, but how do we try to move some of those things into a virtual space? Um, I've also gotten a chance to talk to Alder Manhattan a little bit about how we can better um, build out some of our virtual engagements. Um, additionally, I would say one of the other pieces that was really important to us is how do we continue to try to move along this spectrum of, of, of helping people understand the budget. I mean, to be frank, uh, before I came to city government, I didn't really understand the budget. And so there was this experience that I was even having um, of learning more of how this works, about what some of the constraints are, all of these different things. And so one of the things that we, we, we thought, thought about and, and really worked to build was the budget ambassador program, which was really designed to try to um, um, uh, make sure that leaders had a deeper dive into it. There's more opportunities to ask questions and more opportunities to um, really uh, try to lay out the landscape for folks so that they that we knew a number of our community leaders wanted to engage around the budget and so how do we invest in that leadership uh, through knowledge and sharing so that they could be better equipped to have those conversations in their communities um, and the last thing I'll say is the, the truth is that we're still very much on a journey. I, I think that when I look back at some of the ways in which we've engaged this year, um, there's a lot that I think we can be proud of. I think there are a lot of accomplish, accomplishments of, of who we reached, how we reached, how we've supported different organizations to learn more, um, uh, to, to, um, uh, to really build their muscle and understanding and engaging with the budget. But there's certainly still constraints and there's certainly still progress that needs to be made. Uh, ways in which we can think about how our systems can be even more receptive, um, how we think about how we have these conversations earlier, how we base some of the principles that we have in, around engagement into really how we think about engagement year round when it comes to how resources are distributed. So um, I will sort of say, um, you know, very frankly, I think the city is certainly still on that journey. There's a lot to be learned. I'm excited about the work that Q has done with the people's budget. I'm excited about the work that Alderman Han has done around participatory budgeting and um, the city and, and the Office of, uh, of Equity and Racial Justice, as well as the Office of Community Engagement, really looks forward to continued partnership to sort of grow our muscle around this work. But um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to JD, who can talk a little bit more specifically about some of the strategies and programs that we did this year. But thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Candace. And uh, now that you've heard from Candace, you know this part of the presentation, at least, is probably going to go a, a little downhill. Um, but um, I certainly appreciate Candace's partnership uh, throughout this, and in, in making sure that you know the city is thinking about um, equity and inclusion in everything that that we do. Uh, you know, especially um, when it comes to the budget. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. Um, this next slide shows a little bit about, um, and the, the slides look a, a little funky, but um, you know some of the um, uh, uh, some of the routes that we took in order to get feedback from community folks. Um, I'll just echo what what Candace said, um, and you know just really lift up the work that um, uh, uh, Q and Alderwoman Haddon has have been doing on this as you know, a fantastic model for what, what can be done in collaboration with communities. So I wanna make sure that you know, we're giving credit to where credit's due. Um, you know, this year we, we brought back the, the budget survey and um, had uh, more responses um, than ever. Um, but, but we, as Candace mentioned, also had to really push ourselves um, in, in order to um, you know, make sure that we're, we're still hearing from folks even as we're in the middle of a pandemic. So one idea to that would just be to empower community leaders um, to uh, become budget ambassadors and really lead in their own communities uh, to um, host conversations with, with folks so that, that people can listen to each other, understand each other's values, and um, figure out what that means for the 2021 budget, and then um, bring that information back to um, the mayor and back to, to the city. Um, so um, the budget ambassadors, um, we'll talk a little bit more, but um, one of their primary responsibilities for doing these community uh, roundtables 
um, bringing folks, you know, in groups of no more than 10 people to have these really intimate conversations about um, priorities in the budget as well as um, doing some virtual engagement. So we're being as transparent as possible. And uh, those included uh, Facebook Live sessions and virtual town halls so that you could hear directly from decision makers you know, throughout the process so you could come on that journey with us. If you go to the next slide. So at this point, um, I'll talk through um, uh, each of these different uh, methods that we used in order to really hear from folks. Um, you know, as I mentioned, um, we, we brought back the budget survey. Um, last year, I believe we had um, a little over um, 7,000 responses, and this year we had over 38,000 responses. So we had um, more than five times the number of responses that, that we did last year. Um, and those responses came from every single uh, zip code um, in the city, I think to, to be exact, it was uh, 38,336 compared to the um, 7,347 last year. Um, and while every zip code was, you know, represented, as you can see on this chart, um, you know, uh, not every part of the city, frankly, was, you know, represented equally. Um, you, you can see that the north side of the city, you know, was overrepresented um, in, in the survey. And I think that this is one of the lessons that we learned about, you know, the, the, that we can't, you know, rely on necessarily just putting out press releases that we, we really have to, um, you know, engage folks before we even put out a survey like this to make sure that everybody is, is represented. Um, and um, if you go to the, the next slide, um, what, what we tried to do to make sure that we were, were hearing from, you know, folks is, you know, with the budget ambassador and the community roundtable um, portion of this, um, while this was open to anybody and everybody, and we put out an open call for people to join and become budget ambassadors, um, we really focused on um, increasing representation on the, the south and west sides of the city. Um, and as you can see, um, those numbers started to even out a little bit compared to, to the survey. Um, so, for instance, uh, we focused on organizations that um, attended uh, the Mayor's Solutions Towards Ending Poverty Summit, um, where, where she put forward a goal of, um, you know, eliminating generational poverty in Chicago. And at that meeting, um, people could raise their hand and, and agree to host um, these intimate conversations with people in their community um, with issues related to poverty. And, we, you know, we certainly um, see the budget as, as a great tool for, for thinking about a lot of these issues. And so, um, um, we reached out to folks um, like those participants and the folks that are uh, part of our racial equity rapid response team that, that was stood up um, when the, it became clear that the COVID pandemic was not impacting, um, you know, every part of the, of the city equally and that uh, folks on the south and west sides were disproportionately being impacted um, by the virus. Um, and, um, you know, so um, we did a, a better job at, at getting some representation from across the city, but, you know, still still not perfect. Um, I mean, especially, you know, looking at the, the west sides of the city and um, the, the southwest, you know, sides, I, I think that there's still um, a, a lot more that we can do to, to make sure that every voices are being heard. Um, you know, this is the first time we've done anything like this. Um, you know, never in the history of Chicago have we... Um, you know, um, ask people to um, become ambassadors, learn about the budget, and, you know, really in partnership with us, you know, host these, these conversations. And so we had about 141 um, folks sign up, 52 of which um, hosted roundtables, um, some of which did uh, multiple, um, and that we were able to collect 722 testimonies. So um, whereas with the survey, we were really looking for the, the quantitative um, data, you know, with this, we we're hoping to go a lot deeper and, and really understand why people, um, you know, perhaps um, ranked uh, one so, uh, city service over the other, understanding the values that, that drove people to, to make the decisions that, that they made. Um, go to the next slide, please. You know, um, Candace mentioned a couple of values um, that, that were really important to us um, throughout this process. And, and you know, transparency is, is certainly among those. So, um, you know, especially with the, the, the difficult decisions that the mayor and her team uh, needed to make around this, you know, very, very challenging uh, budget, we wanted to make sure that we were um, coming to folks um, with, with information, you know, about the budgeting process, about the choices that, that we had to make, and really, you know, bring forward the, the people that were creating the, the budgets at the departmental level to, to hear from them on um, a different 
priorities and, and constraints um, that we were dealing with um, when it came to a lot of these issues. So um, as you can see, we started out with a state of the, the budget address and then you know, went into um, a couple of topics in a lot more depth. Um, after which we um, um, organized another state of the budget with Mayor Lightfoot um, so that she could talk a little bit about you know, what she heard throughout the community engagement um, process um, as, as well as um, you know, what she was able to do with that information and you know, the choices that, that she made with that in hand. Uh, next slide. Um, is there an another slide? Did we skip one? Can you go back one? Um, okay. Yeah, so um, uh, as far as results, I, I can, um, you know, you can find a complete set of results at um, this website right here, uh, www.chicago.gov slash 2021 budget. But we can go over just a couple of specific findings that, that we learned from all these community engagement um, activities. Um, go to the next slide, please. Um, I, I'm sorry, it looks like we're, we're missing a slide. If you could go back one, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what we found before we're gonna go into the results. Um, so as, as far as you know, what people said in the, the survey, um, you know, I think that a couple of findings really stood out to us. Um, you know, one, no matter what part of the city, you know, um, respondents, um, you know, responded from, um, uh, consistently we saw that public health um, and community services were ranked the top two um, city services um, out of um, all of them, including community services, public health, infrastructure, other public safety, streets and sanitation, library, city development, cultural fair, regulatory services, and uh, police services. Um, we also heard that um, in uh, some of the community roundtables, as well as the ambassador conversations uh, with Mayor Lightfoot. Um, when we dive deeper into what kind of community services um, people were really passionate about, um, we found that uh, many respondents ex expressed really strong support uh, for violence prevention, uh, for mental health, uh, for homelessness um, supports, and uh, youth services. Um, so th those were, um, you know, something that the, the mayor heard loud and clear that should be, um, you know, uh, reflected in, in the budget that, that we put forward. Um, we, we did find that a lot of people on the survey um, elected to reallocate money away from police services and express concern about the amount of money that was dedicated uh, to CPD's um, budget. Um, I believe out of um, you know the thousand dollars that was allocated uh, to people that completed the, the survey grant, um, uh, police services um, uh, came in at about sixty-four dollars out of the thousand. And um, I would say that this is um, different than what we saw when we did this budget last year when um, respondents um, um, said that about 30% of, of the money allocated would go towards uh, police services. So we, we saw a really big decrease in, in prioritizing uh, police services um, in the city budget. Um, I'll also say that um, a large number of respondents um, expressed a desire to invest more resources um, in the neighborhood rather than uh, just in the downtown area. So. Um, based off of all of that, um, um, the, the mayor um, put together a budget proposal that, um, you know, um, reflected some of what she heard in, in some of these um, um, uh, findings from the survey as well as the community roundtables. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, I think that the, the biggest takeaway that the, the mayor heard from uh, this uh, type of input is that um, people wanted to preserve, you know, some of these community services, and you know, really continue to to invest much more deeply in community services and public health um, infrastructure. Um, you know, there's uh, no hiding that this was a very difficult budget with a 1.2 billion dollar gap, and so um, you know, despite tough choices that that needed to be made. Uh, she worked really hard with her team to, to make sure that we were preserving a lot of the community services um, that, that were um, brought to the budget um, last year, in addition to making some additional um, investments. And these include um, $7 million from economic recovery from the pandemic, um, increasing um, the amount of money that we spent on violence prevention um, uh, by increasing that to uh, by $5 million um, and a quarter. Um, um, bring it up to $16.5 million. Um, also making sure that we're uh, sustaining and not cutting the $10 million investment that we made in uh, affordable housing for the 2020 budget. 
um, and adding $2 million for the Renew a Woodlawn Initiative um, uh, to support the Woodlawn Housing Ordinance that was passed last year. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, making um, investments um, in youth as well um, by providing an additional $1.7 million uh, to support the My Shy, My Future um, uh, Youth Services Program with the goal of um, making sure that um, every young person in Chicago is connected um, to, uh, to programs that, that match some of their interests and that there's bridges uh, between those programs. Um, so these are just a, a couple of the investments that are in the budget plan. Um, you know, like I said, no doubt that this was a, a very difficult budget, but, you know, was really important for, for her after seeing the results of that survey to, to make sure that um, we were preserving um, uh, some of those programs and even increasing um, investment um, to a, a lot of these social safety nets. Um, we, we realized that there is much more investment that is needed. And um, we, we realize that, you know, there's so much more, you know, need that is out there through these um, community roundtable conversations. And, you know, I'll just say that the, the feedback that we received is not only helpful in putting together this year's budget plan, but it's something that um, is going to inform future policy decisions uh, further down the road. Um, so that with that, next slide. Um, I just want to thank you. Um, uh, specifically, I, I, wa I want to thank everybody that participated um, in this budget process, whether you completed the budget survey, um, you participated in a community roundtable, or um, um, really took on a leadership role as a budget ambassador. Um, we had just incredible support for this. And, you know, as Candace says, we're, we're going to continue to push ourselves to, you know, start this earlier, to be more inclusive, to bring more people in, and uh, really have a continued conversation about um, uh, Chicago residents' uh, values and how we can um, build a, a budget that, that reflects those. Uh, so with that, I am going to um, uh, turn it over to Alderwoman Haddon, um, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the participatory budgeting uh, that she's been doing um, in the 49th Ward. Great. Thanks so much, Shady. Um, and hello, everybody. Uh, it's really an honor to be on this panel gonna spend a, a, little, a little bit of time with you uh, sharing about participatory budgeting um, and uh, my experiences and our community experiences here in the 49th Ward, but also um, uh, in the United States. Uh, wanna start off really brief kind of intro here. So participatory budgeting, uh, we call it PB for short, um, started in 1989 in Porto Alegre, Brazil. So um, setting the stage a little bit there, um, imagine, this should not be too hard if you're a Chicagoan, imagine living in a city where for decades and decades, um, people in power, in political power, in elected power, um, have been making decisions about how to spend public dollars um, that in a way that's so imbalanced that it's only benefiting a, a wealthy small percentage. A lot of focus on a downtown area, wealthy neighborhoods, lots of investment there, leaving uh, neighborhoods full of uh, residents in your city, in your community, um, without adequate infrastructure, without good schools, without the kind of investments that you need in order to thrive, um, survive, and, and feel like you're a part of the city. All right, so put yourself in that context. And imagine then there's a political movement um, from the left that focuses on centering working people and working families. Um, and in this political movement, they also work to think about how you could not only reprioritize um, funds to make sure they're supporting working peoples, but also understood that maybe we need a whole different process about how we regularly make decisions about budgets. So if you can put yourself in that situation, um, that was really the context, right, in Porto Alegre, Brazil, um, in the, the late 80s, um, that, that brought about the first participatory budgeting process that we have in, in the, the world. Um, so it wasn't just about making sure that we could reinvest in, in neighborhoods where we divested. It was about knowing that they needed to change the whole process by which decision makers chose to allocate funds. So participatory budgeting, in short, 
is about community members directly deciding how to allocate some significant portion of public dollars. So a real direct democratic process. Um, here in the 49th Ward, um, in uh, serving the Rogers Park and Westridge uh, neighborhood, we had our first experience in the US. Um, my predecessor, Alderman Joe Moore, worked with the Participatory Budgeting Project um, to design a process uh, mimicking the Porto Alegre uh, PD process to find a way to give Chicago residents direct decision-making power over a portion of the budget. Um, so since 2009 in the 49th Ward and since 2011 in Chicago, working with the Great Cities Institute at UIC, um, we've had residents directly deciding how to allocate infrastructure dollars. So the only uh, money that here older people have direct control over for the most part is our ward menu money and that's infrastructure. So we have a process by which we are working to um, introduce this budget to residents, give them education and information uh, about how money has been spent previously, about what types of rules or limitations the, the city or this particular budget um, has in structures. Um, we ask residents to brainstorm the ideas, right? What kind of problems do we need to solve here that we could use this money to address? Um, they work through committees that are supported by my staff, um, by other government entities, by our nonprofit partners um, in going from, well, we need to make this street safer for pedestrians to here's a project we want to recommend that involves some, you know, speed cameras and maybe a more visible crosswalk. Um, we uh, work to create these projects with the residents. They go on a ballot. And then each year we let anyone who's 14 uh, years of age or older in our community vote um, on how these dollars should be allocated from the projects available. The projects with the most votes um, are what we fund in the decisions that I put forth to the city. Um, that's a really basic snapshot of, of how PD works here in Chicago. Um, I um, was a founding board member of the Participatory Budgeting Project, and through that work, um, spent a lot of time in the Midwest and Southern United States, um, but also, um, you know, had the opportunity to work with communities around the world. So this process, um, this radical idea of community members directly deciding how to spend parts of our budget has been used in, in more than 2,500 cities around the world um, on municipal budgets, um, programmatic things, not just infrastructure, within schools. Um, here within Chicago Public Schools, many wards and many schools have used PB for students directly deciding. Um, in Toronto, the Toronto, the second largest public housing entity in North America, um, residents in public housing get to decide how to use dollars to improve public housing. So it's a, a simple idea. Um, it can be complex to, to implement. And um, if we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about some of the lessons um, learned through this process. Um, and then I'll end in talking about some of the challenges. So from the Porto Alegre uh, experience to, uh, I mean, to work in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is the first city in the US South to do PB, um, there's a lot of similarities in what we see when we provide these real participatory processes. So a couple key elements. Um, one, when designing these processes, it's very important to make sure that the people who are going to be involved in your process are part of your process design. So from the start, um, working with residents to determine how best they can be engaged, what types of rules and structures, uh, and even working to assess um, what types of issues are most important to them can help lead you to what part of the budget you might wanna build your process around. Um, we've definitely seen that processes like PB can engage historically marginalized residents. Now, when we get to this, this is really about redesigning a democratic process. And when we can redesign a process from the ground up, um, centering it around people impacted by the process, you've got an opportunity to uh, avoid some of the systemic pitfalls um, that we're normally structured in. Um, you've got an opportunity to build buy-in support um, and real ownership of community members in your process 
um, this means it's an opportunity to bring in people who our standard processes um, exclude uh, or ignore. Um, also seeing that uh, participatory budgeting processes help to build civic knowledge and better trust in government. So having an opportunity, which is unusual for whether it's uh, public employees or whether it's elected officials to work in a genuine process um, that has a clear beginning, middle, end, rules and a participatory design component um, and to be able to end your process by actually doing the thing that you said you were going to do, it builds trust, right? And that's relationship building. Um, as a Chicagoan, uh, we've got a lot of work to do in that area. Um, we have a history of distrust. Um, we've got a history of abuse of power in a lot of our elected and appointed leadership roles and processes like PB could really help us to build and rebuild that credibility and build relationships with our residents. And then lastly, um, PB can empower residents to engage beyond your participatory budgeting process. Um, I'll say um, throughout uh, processes here in Chicago and around the country, uh, you see a lot of people who had never participated in a government process before. Um, I say myself, um, I was a volunteer in our first participatory budgeting process in the 49th Ward. It was in the middle of the housing crisis. Um, I was at a pretty low point in how I thought about local government um, because they couldn't help me as I was going through the housing crisis. But I saw a flyer that said, hey, uh, come spend a million dollars to improve your community. Through months of engaging with my residents, I got to know people. We got to actually um, build projects that while they didn't solve my immediate issue, they made my community better. And that process is empowering, um, getting to do something, having the opportunity to make a difference, to improve your life, the life of somebody else in your neighborhood. Um, that helps to build uh, this internal feeling that can encourage people. And we see folks go on to either participate in other organizations, other community things, and it really builds our civic power. Uh, next slide. So um, one of the um, other important things to, to think about as we look at lessons learned um, with participatory budgeting, however, is that um, PB is not a magic, it's not a magic button, right? Um, having an engagement process doesn't just mean that you're going to get the engagement that you want. And if you don't intentionally acknowledge uh, systemic uh, oppression, if you don't know within whatever system you're operating, in this case, the city of Chicago, if you don't acknowledge name and design to avoid uh, systemic issues, you will replicate them. Um, you know, even with a lot of outreach and planning and intentional design, um, we still see PB processes in the United States mostly skew towards the same types of uh, overrepresentation that you can see in other democratic processes, right? Um, more homeowners um, uh, skewing towards, you know, white folks, skewing towards people with higher education levels or higher income levels, right? So it, it takes a, a really different framework um, and intentional design to avoid these pitfalls. Also, um, working with government funds, bureaucracy is a nightmare. Um, but it's not just about bureaucratic process. Um, when we look at our budgets, there's very little built into our budgets year to year where we have a lot of room to move. As we're in the middle of our budget process for the city of Chicago right now, um, you know, this becomes apparent. As you see some of the results from the surveys that, that uh, Candace and JD showed, um, People want a different allocation of funds. Um, they want to reprioritize how we spend our how we spend our dollars. And as uh, government uh, representatives, we're oftentimes bound um, by obligations, by debt, by contracts, by statutes, right, um, or by state law sometimes to uh, not be able to immediately or quickly be as responsive to community needs. And so working with PV processes, I find you can really identify 
where those blocks are. You can identify the gaps between what people want, what they are asking you to prioritize, what you can actually do. And I think it actually creates a bit of a mandate for us in government to look at how we need to change our processes so that we can be more responsive and more representative um, for our communities. And then lastly, um, and this is going back to the Porto Alegre. Uh, oh, still on the, uh, there we go, staying on that slide. Um, and that next slide is not needed. Um, but the last point here is that relying on elected officials to implement these processes um, can lead to inconsistency. So here in Chicago, um, we still operate at the ward level working with menu money because we haven't gotten to a place where despite several years, um, almost a decade of trying, where we've gotten the city of Chicago to decide that a participatory budgeting process is worthwhile. Um, in most other places in the world, like uh, uh, Paris, um, uh, in Spain, uh, in, 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 in South Korea, um, mostly PB is practiced at a citywide level and not just in districts. Um, and when you have a process that's more embedded, um, with that just becomes the way that we do things, you really get to the power of culture shifting. And like in the Porto Alegre uh, uh, experience in the beginning, they knew that changing the process was necessary. So they didn't have to rely on, you know, someone favorable being elected to office or in power for marginalized communities to continue to be valued, to be seen and to be lifted up. Um, so that's where, where I'll stop. Um, and uh, we'll definitely share information in some of the, the chat and the links if you're interested in learning more about participatory budgeting. Thank you, Alderwoman Haddon. Uh, we appreciate your perspective in showing us some alternatives to local decision making. I would like to invite Ivan and Paula to discuss the People's Budget Project. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Alderwoman Haddon, for all the work that you're doing, and thanks as well to Candace Moore and J.D. Van Slyke for their efforts to build racial equity. So Paula and I are now going to talk about the People's Budget Chicago. The People's Budget Chicago is a project organized by Chicago United for Equity with the goal to engage with and to amplify the voices of the communities most impacted by racial inequity in the decision-making process for our city budget. Next slide, please. So to understand the investment priorities of our most impacted communities, we started by researching and identifying which Chicago communities are the ones most affected by inequities. We began by measuring inequity based on 29 indicators used by the Child Opportunity Index, which include information from the domains of education, from health and environment, and as well as social and economic opportunity. We then looked at and accounted for the varied size of the populations in Chicago's community areas and how that affects their inequity scores. We looked at the number of wards that each community area borders, and we came up with a map that ranked the top 15 communities based on this criteria, which is what you see here on the screen. We consulted with individuals and organizations that have deep roots in the south and west sides, who also then recommended adding Roseland and Bronzeville to our list. So with that list in hand, we designed an engagement process that prioritized small group engagement in order to center the voices and priorities of these communities, as well as um, to reflect the kind of current moment with COVID that we're all going through. And Paula will speak more about that in a bit. We ended up doing a pilot run in August in Englewood, and then we partnered with community-based organizations and went to Bronzeville, to West Humboldt Park, to Austin, to Roseland, to Uptown, to Alt-Gilt Gardens, went back to Englewood, and we finished with Greater Grand Crossing. Next slide, please. Now, beyond selecting which communities to prioritize, one of the challenges of the project was how to translate the opaque data and bureaucratic language of city budgets and the budget process into an accessible format. So we began with the categories that Chicagoans had told us were their core values during Chicago United for Equity's 2019 Vote Equity Project. So those are the first five categories that you see here. That's health, education, housing, infrastructure, and community resources. We also included departments related to the police into a carceral state category based on ongoing public debates about the role of policing in our society. We then took the 37 departments in the city budget that best fit those categories to come up with the dollar amounts we're spending in each of those areas. 
So a critical part of these budget conversations and of the um, people's budget process was explaining to people that the city budget does not include the budgets of very large agencies like Chicago Public Schools, the Chicago Housing Authority, the Chicago Transit Authority, Chicago City Colleges, or the Park District, that they have their own separate budget uh, processes. So that means that the voting on spending on education in the people's budget Chicago only includes early childhood education. And it doesn't include money for CPS or city colleges. Likewise, when we talked about the people's budget Chicago and the process we did, housing funding doesn't include the CHA and um, dollars that are spent by the Cook County Health Department are not reflected in the health category as well. Next slide, please. And what we see is that conversations about the complexities of the budget were an important part of the People's Budget Chicago process. But the central question that we wanted the communities most impacted to address was what does your community need to be safe and thriving? And so here are three responses from Englewood, West Humboldt Park and Bronzeville, where people wrote out um, individually uh, what they thought where would be their responses to those questions. And then in small groups, we had a discussion about those priorities and how those translated into um, dollars spent in each of the categories we had. But rather than hear from us, we think you should hear a bit more from residents in the communities we visited. And so we have a short video we would like to play for everyone. And so if we could play the video, that'd be great. Thank you. This year, the city of Chicago's budget was $12.6 billion. For 2021, our city is planning to spend even more, $13.5 billion. That's a lot of money, but no matter how much we have, we're always told there's not enough for our communities. What if the problem isn't how much we have, but how our politicians are spending it? If we could choose where our dollars go, how would we invest in building safe and thriving communities? Homeownership. Housing. Money to like to house people to build more houses. Community resources. Community resources. The infrastructure of the schools that we already have here that aren't being used. Lack of quality education. Education, community resources, and health. Definitely health. Dealing with health. Health, education, housing, infrastructure, and community resources. Something that I heard a lot from people was also mental health resources and health resources in general. Free health clinics, places to go, especially for things like mental health resources. Housing and mental health. More money put into mental health. Education. Housing and education and mental health. More police accountability and mental health. For me, it's very important that torture survivors' voices are heard as well as the disabled and those who suffer with mental health issues. People. People. People, people, we have to put the time and the money into the actual person. Otherwise, the buildings won't matter when the people are too sick or mentally ill to appreciate them. The People's Budget Chicago started with communities most impacted by historical disinvestment. Neighbors came together in Inglewood, Bronzeville, West Humboldt Park, Austin, Roseland, Uptown, Altgale Gardens, Ryden Park, and Greater Grand Crossing to answer the question, what do our communities need to be safe and thriving? They debated, negotiated, and ultimately worked together to build a budget that invests in a better future for all of us. The People's Budget Chicago says that for every $100 of our tax money, we should spend $22 in health, 21 in housing, 19 in education, 19 in community resources, 12 in infrastructure, and seven in the carceral system that includes policing and police accountability. This might seem obvious to most of us, but right now, it's a huge shift from how our leaders spend our dollars. The People's Budget Chicago shows us that by reducing police spending, we have enough for our communities to invest in early childhood education, mental health and healthcare, and affordable housing. We need every person that believes in equitable and fair investment of city resources to reach out to their older people starting today. Call your older people, email them, mail them an old school handwritten letter, send them a tweet, and demand that they fight to create a city budget that reflects the needs and will of the people.
Thank you. Now, Paula, I'll kick it over to you. Thank you, um, Yvonne and uh, MPC team for putting this together. Um, our um, Candace Moore, JD, Maria, uh, Alderwoman Hayden, uh, I'm just really excited that we're all in this space to have a conversation about um, what our community, what, what our community is saying, how we're hearing them, and how we um, are just willing to go um, to push the conversation about a fair and equitable budget. Uh, so at Q, we um, strongly believe that um, if we want to see different outcomes, um, we really need to design and invest. I'm going to highlight that and invest in different processes. Um, I'm, a, I'm an urban designer and a lot of the practice that I um, lead uh, focuses on connecting communities to design processes. So you can see the engagement design um, of the People's Budget Chicago was very intentional about centering people's voices. Um, the in-person workshops, uh, some of the images and some of the video that you saw and, and, and the tools that uh, we designed prioritize um, meeting people where they were at. You know, we had to take a bus uh, to Algo Gardens and far south side, west side, um, and also find uh, partners, community organizations that wanted to partner and connect with their um, community members to talk about, to have conversations about uh, budget priorities. Uh, and so uh, through partnering with community organizations uh, and creating accessible tools, we were able to create the spaces where um, conversations about um, budget uh, prioritization uh, happen. And uh, the, the flow of the workshops was designed in three parts. Um, mostly you see depicted there the board that we designed to talk about the categories that Ivan described, but it, it was designed in three parts. One was about uh, collective reflection. And this was the part where we talk about values, community values, because we had to ground the decision-making process, not in individual priorities, but in collective priorities. And how, the, how would those uh, values and priorities established here will impact the rest of the process. The second part was the budgeting game. So now that you have these resources, how would you allocate them? What was interesting about this side uh, or this part of the process was um, that everyone saw what each other's decisions were about allocation of resources. And that led into very interesting conversations about uh, how folks were designing to invest more in health or education and housing and how others thought infrastructure investment was important but not as needed as uh, um, community resources and services that focus more um, on, on the people. The third part was, um, well, now that we uh, agree or have at least a common ground through value reflection and second, we uh, agree on a form of a collective budget, now what can we do? So the third part was about making a plan to take action. And that could take uh, several forms. Now, um, so that was more, uh, that was in uh, overall the structure of these workshops uh, and, and these conversations that took place in, in, in all the neighborhoods that you saw. Next slide, please. Uh, can you advance to the next slide? Thank you. Um, sorry, there's, there's a little lag. Uh, so we know that uh, the numbers only tell us half of the story. And this is why we were also very intentional about capturing people's voices. We didn't um, necessarily want it to be mediating that message or the reflections um, that um, folks and residents in these neighborhoods were making. We just wanted to document them and share them and amplify the voices of the community members that were invested in, in wanting to learn more, uh, not only about the established system for in the process to um, create a budget, but also how they could uh, have more agency uh, and get more involved with advocacy um, efforts. Um, so we, we documented all this. Uh, if you go to peoplesbudgetchicago.com, you'll find a link where you can access um, a plenty of stories uh, of the people who actually build the people's budget. Another important part of this process was to translate this engagement process into an online environment. And the online, uh, the website also had the budgeting, um, the budget game and the budgeting tool that was interactive. And uh, we use a, the similar language, the graphic language that you saw um, that was used in the, in the physical boards was translated into a, um, a digital interactive tool. 
Uh, so the people across from across the city could also um, uh, do both. Uh, hear the perspectives from all the in-person and committee members that we were meeting in the far south side and the south side and the west side, um, but also could visit and participate. So we were aggregated multiple responses, but we made really clear that the priority here was elevating the voices of, of the most impacted communities. Um, can we go to the next slide? And so another significant component of this process was to build a framework of accountability. And uh, let me emphasize that accountability uh, for us is not necessarily seen as a requirement, but more like how do you build accountability as a practice? And that is embedded and designed from the very um, testing and design process of any um, community um, engagement process. So um, at each workshop, um, we uh, had the residents after the exercise was completed, we had residents design designate their budget representative or their budget reps, like we um, dearly call them. Uh, the budget reps uh, from different communities afterwards, uh, they connected with each other. Uh, they, uh, they had their own meetings and like, if you can imagine, you know, uh, a resident from uh, Humboldt Park talking about community uh, and, and budget priorities, as a, as, a, as a representative from Greater Grand Crossing. Imagine what conversation would that look like? They, there's so um, many aspects in common, but also some important conversations about like how they feel or not connected to their uh, elected officials. Um, so they connected among themselves, but also as a group, they strategize how to connect with their other people uh, to have their, their voices heard. And uh, they form uh, what we call uh, the People's Budget Council. Uh, the People's Budget Council has met uh, over the last weeks. Um, it has been both an opportunity for folks to know what are our efforts um, uh, that they need to amplify within their communities, but also how to connect to the city, um, the, the budget approval process. Uh, so this week, uh, the People's uh, Budget Council has been gearing up for the big push uh, and call for their older people and community members before the budget uh, vote happens uh, next week. And this is some of the hand, uh, like um, in the video was mentioned, like handwritten um, messages to um, other, pe other people. Can we go to the next slide, please? Well, there's just so much more to share about this process, but uh, hopefully this conveys um, the, the key engagement principles and strategies that we look forward to put together shaping uh, the People's Budget Chicago. And, and you know, with the example, uh, with the different kind of approaches and, and you know, from, different, uh, from our different efforts, uh, we can get to discuss collectively in this space. Uh, they are, these are just some uh, resources um, that are online uh, currently, and uh, we're, we're happy to engage uh, into more the cross-reference about this, this different efforts. Thank you. I'll pass it back to um, Adam. Thank you, Paula, and thank you, everyone, for your great words uh, and, and your information. Uh, I do apologize. There is some um, drilling going on above me, so if you hear that, it is not near you. It is uh, one of the obstacles of working from home these days, so I apologize. Uh, the first question I would like to ask you all, and you all hinted at this uh, or discussed it in, in varying degrees in your presentation, but uh, what approach did you take to educate and provide information to your about the city's budget. And uh, I, I know we talked about online tools and discussions uh, that were had, but in the engagement process, how did you cl clarify or translate uh, to the people that were actually engaged in the discussion itself, uh, how the city budget is operating and, and how decisions are made? Uh, and I, I will guess I'll ask uh, Alderwoman Haddon if she will start us off there especially with her work in discussions that go on in the 49th Ward in particular. Sure. Thanks, Adam. Um, honestly, we use some of the graphics, um, the, the graphics and the visuals that, that the city put together, um, both last year and this year, I feel like have been really helpful, a big step forward, actually, in helping people look at a budget holistically, right? So even starting with the basics of um, our revenue and our expenses. Um, 
Uh, last year, we put together a guide, which we'll revise for this year as well, called Our City by the Numbers. It's just a Google Doc <laughs> um, where I took pictures of commissioners, right, um, at the budget hearings to introduce people to the people who work for the city for these different departments to outline what these departments are, like what is the government in the city of Chicago that we're spending $13 billion on. Um, and then also trying to um, focus on um, just making it more accessible. Um, so we also did our own budget survey that was very similar to the citywide survey and showed um, our residents kind of uh, comparisons in responses, um, but also tried to reflect back what we saw as priorities that, that people were telling us. Um, and outside of understanding the budget and the dollars and where they're going, um, I've spent a lot of time and my team has spent a lot of time focusing on how I'm going to make decisions, right? What's the decision-making process that the city's going through? And what am I committing to doing in my decision-making process with them? Thank you very much. Uh, JD, do you have any thoughts on that, especially with all the different activities that you outlined from the, the online survey to the virtual events to the budget ambassadors facilitated discussions? Yeah, uh, thanks. So, yeah, I, th I think with the uh, virtual engagements, um, we tried to bring uh, uh, people to, to the table that, you know, we're making the, the decisions here, um, you know, and, and mix it with folks that have like the, the budget expertise and then the people in the departments that, you know, have to put together the, the individual, you know, budget. So um, when we did uh, budget week, um, you, you saw that with um, uh, budget director Susie Park, um, you know, giving her address and then um, having an informal conversation um, with uh, some of the commissioners that are making some of these like programmatic uh, decisions uh, so that people had access to, to both kind of the nuts and the bolts as well as, you know, the, the values and the programs um, that uh, the money was going to, to support. Um, so um, hopefully by, you know, making those folks accessible, um, you know, there is some education there. I think that, you know, this year we attempted to um, do some education with the um, ambassadors as well. Um, you know, there, there was a training we provided um, some information to equip them to, you know, go out in their communities and have conversations with, with, with people. And, you know, I, I think that one of the challenges there is that you, um, there's just so much, you know, to the budget, it's hard to know, you know, what to, to focus on. And so um, we, we did our best attempt at um, uh, equipping them with information that they felt like would definitely come up and then just establish kind of that open lines of communication with our office, um, with the, the budget team, you know, as questions. Uh, did come up. Um, and then I, I think that the final thing that we um, uh, tried to do with the survey this year is, you know, in some of the questions, um, uh, build in some of the trade-offs that, that would happen. So, you know, that people come along on this journey, you know, with us and trying to, you know, kind of internalize um, some of the decisions that, you know, the, the mayor and our senior team are making. And, you know, if you're taking, um, you know, if you're adding money to a specific department, you know, you're, you're raising funds, um, you know, or, or you're making cuts and, and you know, having them, uh, you know, folks that are um, responding to the survey start to understand what some of those trade-offs are um, so that we can, you know, better understand what that process looks like. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Paula, Yvonne, do you have any thoughts on educating the public about the budget? And I know, Yvonne, you shared a little bit about uh, the multiple le levels of government with different budgets. Uh, but even in the conversations that you had in that awesome video with community members, like what were the clarifying questions that they had? What were they uh, curious about? Uh, what were the, their reactions to some of the information that you all provided? I can reference, and, and Yvonne uh, already um, shared some of this. You know, the first thing, and I just put a link in the chat um, about, you know, some of the some of the community members, uh, the roundtables and workshops, uh, this differentiation of like what city council has power over approving versus what they don't. That was a big piece of information that started the conversation very strong with like why, how, you know, this it, we we make assumptions about knowledge that um, it's important to have this. That was important to have as a common ground. Also you know, the calendar, like why, you know, this starts in August or July, like, should we start in January? Like, 
this is important like it's because it's so complex and layer as a process and the depth and the 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 type of information that needs to be processed like it feels like starting in the middle of the year uh, it feels a little late right so i feel like understanding process understanding what is included what is not um, it was because we look at this for months just to put this project together. We understood it, but once we came out and, and, and engaged others, we understood that was a very, very critical part of, of some of the educational resources. Yeah, and I would just add to what Paula said that um, some of the things that people found very puzzling and uh, kind of that they wanted to know more about are, for example, why we have sister agencies and how those work differently from uh, the city budget. and kind of a bit of an informational process in terms of talking about how um, through our elected representatives, the aldermen, alderwomen, you know, we have some uh, relationship to that city budget, but that works very differently with the sister agencies where, that, where they go their own separate kind of budgeting process. So people wanted to know more about that. People were also interested in thinking about and communicated that um, having a one-year budget process didn't seem to make sense, that when they think about their budgets and their own personal finances, they're often thinking, you know, in longer terms or not making just decisions about the next year and December 31st, everything changes. So why um, our budget process kind of looks the way it does was something that was very interesting to people. And also um, we had to explain a bit about the complicated relationship between Cook County dollars, our city dollars, federal dollars. And again, um, much as Candace said, until kind of starting to work on this process, I didn't certainly know as much about the budget as I do today. And I still don't know all that I want to know about the budget. So I think that reflects where people are as well. And there, there's a lot more education that needs to happen. But I think at the same time, also a lot more reflection about how things might need to change or would be better if they changed as well. So not to take the process as a given, but as something that is alive and that could change to better reflect people's needs and experiences as well. is something that we heard a lot from people. Yes, thank you, Yvonne and Paula. Um, I would also like to ask you all how the information that you all collected in your different engagements was used for budget decision making or informed uh, the deliberations that occurred within your staff or, or your communities uh, to actually talk about the results. And I know the, the city had its release of the budget survey results as well that, that talked about uh, greater investments uh, or, or difference of investment with police and with health in the wake of COVID-19 and with uh, the murder of George Floyd. Uh, how are those opinions, those views, those desires captured and then uh, inform, how do they actually inform the budget process? And I'll, I'll ask uh, Alderwoman Haddon again, since she's uh, done this several years, uh, what that looks like and, and how does that inform decision-making? I get to start with this question. <laughs> Fine. Um, and, and I was typing, I typed a couple of responses to some of the Q&A that, that folks have had in there as well. Um, I mean, in 2015, um, we had our first movement for Black Lives convening in Cleveland, Ohio. And it was one of the first places where I um, uh, presented a workshop that I did a couple of times that was about budgets for Black lives, right? And looking at participatory budgeting, looking at what we've been learning um, in community uh, around uh, participatory budgeting, the opportunities that community-based budgeting offers us and how that directly intersected, right, with the movement for Black lives. Um, here we are in 2020, um, still just kind of saying the same things. Um, and, and this, this actually, um, uh, Sarah Atlas has a question in the, in the chat. I guess my answer kind of ties into that. Um, it's really hard. I'll say like right now, I haven't made a decision on whether to support the current budget that that's been presented. And we've been working as a progressive caucus, as a black caucus on making sure that we identify priorities that we hear from our communities, you know, um, you know, can we reduce police funding so that we can bolster mental health? Um, like, can we do that? And as a city, we can, we could make those choices and what we see presented to us, um, sometimes it's hard because it might be moving in the right direction, 
but it's difficult to navigate what's the right direction and what's the right speed. Um, we need to continue to live in this uncomfortable space, and I'll say I do, of, of what I hear from my community, what I hear from Chicagoans, um, to continue to keep the pressure on government. Um, we are not, government is not going to change on its own, and I think people know that. Government won't change on its own. We will keep making the same decisions around the same things. And part of it is being stuck in some ways in some of our structural traps within our budget. Um, will we see is, is kind of radical and dramatic a change as we wanna see year to year? Probably not. Um, and in some cases, that's a good thing. You don't necessarily want your, your government um, radically changing year to year because that can cause a lot of instability in services. Um, but I know that um, keeping that pressure going, making um, significant decisions and structural changes is how we, is how we show residents we're listening. Um, it's how we show residents that our values align with their values. And I think that that's the challenge and, and to part of Sarah's question on how we build that faith and build that trust. That's how um, as individuals and, and as a city council um, continuing to in our decisions that we make um, uh, reflect and kind of show the work of, of why we're deciding and showing that we're continuing to make progress. Thank you, Alderwoman Haddon. Uh, JD, I, I know that you're not on the finance team by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but I am curious how uh, the community engagement process was described to finance and to the mayor's office, and if they had any questions or thoughts or, or initial reactions to the feedback from folks that might actually uh, change their view or, or make them reconsider an approach to funding certain services over others, or if there was any any additional considerations or surprises from the feedback that you got uh, that the mayor's office uh, took into consideration. Yeah. Um, well, first off, I, I think that there's a lot of wisdom in, in what Alder Woman had and said, so I, I just want to acknowledge that. I thought that was a really great, beautiful answer. Um, you know, I, the community engagement process, you know, it wasn't, you know, uh, my brainchild or Candace. This, this came from the mayor. You know, she wanted to hear from folks related to this budget. She knew that this was going to be a very difficult budget. She knew that there was going to be hard decisions um, that would need to be made. And there might be differences between, um, you know, the, the direction she ultimately ended up going and, you know, what she heard in, in the community engagement process. And so it, it, it's risky, right? Like if you do a process like that and, and you make all the results accountable and there, there's, there's differences, you know, you, you have to answer to those. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's, in my opinion, a, a very, you know, brave thing to, to put herself out there in, in that way. Um, you know, I, I will say that, you know, this was, you know, we started um, at the end of August and, um, you know, did this engagement um, th throughout uh, September and into October. And um, uh, the mayor has, you know, regular meetings with the budget director and her senior team, you know, to, to talk through some of these really difficult decisions. And um, every week we, uh, she was provided, you know, um, information from, you know, what we were hearing in these community, you know, uh, budget processes. So um, getting results of, of the survey back as well as, you know, the report that we made public to everyone, you know, that was the report that was uh, presented to, to the mayor um, and uh, the, the budget director. And, um, you know, on my slide, I, I show you where you can find that report. Um, in addition to that, you know, we, um, for the first time, invited ambassadors um, to have uh, meetings with her and um, have conversations about, you know, what they're hearing in communities. And um, it was different from last year, you know, when we were in a big auditorium and people were, you know, going up and telling her, you know, kind of one by one what, what's important to her. I, I think that, you know, this time it really um, it gave the opportunity to to, you know, think about this at a community level, to think about it a little bit more holistically, and really for her to, you know, ask questions and get information from folks as far as, you know, what are some of the values that um, are, are, you know, driving, you know, uh, what, what are you hearing? And, uh, you know, those conversations, like, you know, um, at times were, you know, uncomfortable and difficult and, and challenging, 
Um, but, um, you know, I think that um, having them, you know, uh, uh, push this better to uh, budget to, to be more equitable, even if we had to make, you know, very hard choices. Um, you know, and I, I think what you mentioned with um, George Floyd with, with COVID-19, I mean, the, it, there's no doubt that the, the stakes this year are, are higher. And, you know, when you think about, um, she had to think about, you know, making cuts, like potentially um, cutting, you know, uh, positions, you know, people and, and, you know, to do that in the context of a p pandemic is, you know, uh, really scary stuff. And so, I mean, what, what she heard and what she took away is that, you know, that, that people are, are needing services, they are needing um, um, housing, that, they, they, that there's a desire to do something about um, homelessness and, and mental health. And, you know, I, I think that she would say, you know, that, that we still have a, a very long way, ways to go. And, um, but, but what, she, you know, she took from this is um, that um, she wanted to do everything that she could to preserve some of those investments that, that we made to, to not move backwards, but, but hold on to those um, while still, you know, trying to, you know, get out of this $1.2 you know, billion dollar gap. So, um, um, it, it, it was a mix, I, I think, of, you know, her receiving data and, you know, then also, you know, really talking to people and, and hearing the stories, you know, behind some of those numbers and, you know, understanding the, the values that, that are, are behind, you know, what, what people put forward in, in the survey. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, Paula and Yvonne, uh, I would be curious as to how you all collected the information that you got from the focus groups in, in the neighborhoods and how that translated into uh, the people's budget as it works. How did you collect all those intimate stories and perspectives in, in a systemic way to come up with the priorities that, that you all uh, shared with us? I want to want to pass that to Ivan because he work, uh, we all work at this uh, report. I just shared the the or like the findings. I shared the link in the chat. Um, people's budget results, uh, but I I want Ivan to help us to understand those um, like four main um, recommendations or findings. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to point out to everybody, Ivan's background is the best Zoom real life background that I've ever seen. So uh, not only is he smart, but he's stylish as well. Go ahead, Ivan. Thanks, Adam. Um, I guess I would actually start just by st noting that in addition to the five categories that we had um, in terms of the People's Budget Chicago project, the one category that ended up being added by uh, community residents was one around accountability and civic participation. We heard a lot about the kind of challenge that they've been having to feel represented, to actually feel like they have a connection to, the, to their older person or older uh, man or older woman. And I know that might be a little different from, you know, Maria Haddon's ward, you know, where that process is kind of an on, more ongoing. Um, so, you know, there was a real call from people to connect better with the representatives, to have better and deeper relationships and to feel heard, honestly. I think that was one of the hard parts to um, go to Sarah's question as well. Uh, was how to build a process um, and a project wherein we didn't go just to the community areas and extract information for our own purposes. We didn't start with any kind of idea about what we would say at the end of this process, as much as we wanted to amplify the voices of what we heard. And so part of that was that trust building process. And, and again, we um, have gone to those community areas, but we're still in touch with those community areas and supporting them through the kind of um, ambassadors that Paula spoke about. And then, you know, the next, another important part for us was to think about um, what we were hearing and how we translate what we're hearing to kind of community conversations and community efforts that are ongoing right now. So for example, um, you know, it was not a surprise since we'd heard it also in uh, the survey that the mayor's office did, as well as what we hear in just general conversation that people thought that we should be spending less on police and police services and spending more of those dollars in other areas that would make people feel like their communities were safer actually and um, help support them to be thriving communities. But what did that mean? And so we started to look at, for example, um, some of the, like the defund campaigns and the recommendations they're putting forward, some of the things that the Fraternal Order Police has actually also said in terms of reducing some spending. And to note that there are things that people, uh, not just in these communities, but all across the city can do to connect with those efforts 
and you know to you know to go and to kind of support what um, all the women had and had noted that without people actually pushing the government to change, it's not going to change, and that that change may be slower than we want, but we still need to keep the pressure up. So I would encourage folks to you know not to make this longer to then go um, to the link that Paula shared to see the recommendations in the categories. Um, that are there and to connect with those uh, community-based organizations leading those efforts so that we can kind of continue to not only put out information about what people want in their city budget, but to continue to put pressure on um, the city to actually translate those uh, priorities into actions. Thank you. And I, you brought up a really good point about uh, building trust. And I kind of do want to ask everyone about that uh, from the city's perspective. Uh, what is the difference between civic engagement and building civic trust? What does that look like? How do you envision that? Uh, what obstacles are you facing on the ground? Uh, and, and what feedback would you have uh, to the residents that say that we distrust government? Uh, I'll actually go to JD and give Maria a, a chance to think for, for once on the question. Uh, yeah, JD, how do you, uh, how do you envision building trust among residents in the city of Chicago and, and what, what positive things have you seen in the process that you've engaged in and, and, and what do you think are some areas for improvement or growth? Um, well, I, I think that it's not a mystery that, you know, um, trust in, in government um, is, you know, at a low, you know, to, to be frank. And, and I think building that trust back up takes, um, it, it takes time. I, you know, I think that, um, you know, people don't want to just feel heard. They, they want to feel listened to. And um, I think that trust comes from um, not only, you know, having um, our office or any government office, you know, repeat back what, what we've heard from folks, but um, to, to really take that information and, and, and use that to build policy that, that gets at the spirit of, you know, what people say. And, you know, that sometimes you're able to do that, um, you know, immediately and other times, you know, working in government systems that, you know, aren't built for rapid change that, you know, it, it takes a, a lot of time, right? And so, you know, when we do things like the survey, it's not only for, for this, you know, budget. I, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's clues to, to, you know, people's um, hopes and desires, you know, at a specific point in time. But, you know, if you take um, last year's survey and this year's survey, and if you, um, you know, take a budget ambassador, like, you know, you, you do all of these different activities and continue to, to show up in communities, um, you, you, you're able to start building a clear picture. And, you know, I, I think that that, um, that kind of work, you know, in, in collaboration with community is what's going to ultimately build trust. And that doesn't happen in one budget cycle. It, it takes a, a really long time. And, and I think that it also comes with partnering with, you know, really trusted institutions. Like, you know, I, I think that um, you know, the, the work that, that you did um, in um, meeting people where, where they are, like if there's opportunities, you know, for us um, in future budgets to, um, you know, work alongside organizations, you know, like you or other organizations that um, are, you know, in community and understand, you know, local context. And, you know, if there's opportunities for us to, you know, bring together uh, all of us together and, you know, think about this, um, you know, holistically, but, you know, based off of, you know, um, what people are saying throughout the city, you know, w w once folks start seeing that, that change, that's when, you know, trust is, is built. Um, but, it, but it does take time. Thank you, Alderman Manhattan. Any thoughts on building trust in community? Um, I, you know, I, I agree with a lot of, of, of what JD had to say, um, kind of at the, at the core level. Um, but I, I will also say, right, um, that it's like it's difficult in an elected position to try and reflect and represent the the needs and the wants and the opinions of all of your residents. Um, I can say before being an elected official, um, I mean from from like twelve wards here in Chicago to 
to Boston, to Greensboro, to Jackson, Mississippi, to New York City, to Vallejo, California, to Oakland, um, to Albuquerque. There's not a community that I've worked with that didn't want the same things though, right? So, I mean, sometimes we complicate things in government. Community members, and we saw this in, in the People's Budget video, they want health, they want safety, they want housing, they want, you know, people to uh, invest in their neighborhoods. So there's economic development. They're really core things. We want good opportunities for education for our kids. Um, this is why government exists. And I feel like when, um, even when you're new to the game, like I am, or Mayor Lightfoot, right? Like when you're, you're coming into a system that's uh, been operating a certain way, um, and there are a lot of things that are locked in place. And also, if we're going to take the great responsibility of changing the way people think of their government, I think we need to take some risks. We need to do things differently. We can't change it all overnight. Um, but again, that building trust goes to telling people who you are, telling people what you believe in, and then making sure that your decision-making and where you have influence matches what you say you're about. And it's, um, it's simple, but not easy. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. And we are almost out of time. So I'm, I'm gonna wrap up this session. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions that are that were asked by participants, but I would encourage you to copy those questions and send them to your older persons and to your and to the mayor and to keep the conversation going so that we can prioritize the budget around the needs of the people. I really want to thank uh, Alderwoman Haddon, uh, JD, Candace, Paula, and Yvonne for being a part of this uh, this this webinar. It's been a really good conversation. Uh, and I know it's really hard since we're, we are in the middle of doing the budget <laughs> to take time to talk to folks as, as the negotiations are going on and considerations are being made. So yes, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you all for attending today. Uh, thank you for, uh, for your great questions and we will follow up and send a, a copy of the slides to you all and a link to the recording for you all to refer back to or to share with friends uh, that were not able to attend. Thank you very much, uh, and we uh, look forward to seeing you at our next MPC event. Thank you. Thanks, Adam.